Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Peter Bush, co-founder and chief strategy officer of Faceware Technologies. Uh, before we get going, we got a lot of people streaming in right in here in our first few minutes. So let let people join for a little bit. Um, do you want to cover some sort of spring clean or uh, house cleaning items? First things first, uh, we do have a comments and questions box. So as we go through the topics here, I'm sure things that you might uh, want to think about and ask myself or our, uh, my co-presenter. John, uh, please put that in the questions box. We've got some time at the end that we'll go through that. Um, we'll just be having a, uh, I'll say a fireside chat. It's just a healthy dialogue back and forth. There will be time for Q&A. Know that this session is being recorded and we will be posting it back out online in the next few weeks and posting that out. So if you've attended, uh, we've got your contact information. We'll share that with you automatically so that if any members of your team or colleagues that you think might be interested in these topics, uh, you can share those uh, with the group. So. We're gonna go ahead and get going here. We've got people still streaming in, but as we get through introductions and before we get into the meat of the, the conversation, uh, it'd be good to sort of know who's here. So again, I'm, I'm Peter Bush. I've been with uh, Faceware now a little over 10 years, celebrating our 10 year anniversary this year. Uh, and eight years ago, I met a gentleman named John McInnes and we started working together in this field and just sort of running in parallel, lots of overlap. Um, but I, you know, if you don't know who John is, you should, and I'd love for John, give a little bit about your background, sort of how the evolution of your career, which is to me the most fascinating aspect of, of what you're going to be talking about today. Um, yeah, I came from screenwriting, so I was a screenwriter, I am a screenwriter, um, came to Hollywood uh, 20 years ago on the back of a scholarship to the, um, uh, to the MFA program at UCLA, um, and so I was a screenwriter, I, my career, writing career, kind of got a bump when I, I won something called the Nicole, which was the um, the Academy Nicole, which is the biggest screenwriting competition in the world that uh, I won for a, a script of mine called uh, Outside the Wire. Um, and that was about private security contractors in, in Iraq in like 2006. So it's this sort of run and gun sort of, you know, action thriller that uh, caught the attention of um, Activision, Call of Duty, and so they ended up hiring me to write Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, which um, um, was the, the latest edition in the, in the franchise to be released on the, what was then at the new platform of uh, PlayStation 4s. So there was a kind of uh, a desire to make this incredibly photorealistic and to sort of make it like a Hollywood blockbuster. And so they wanted to hire sort of Hollywood sort of folks like myself um, Kevin Spacey was the main bad guy. So, so that was my kind of introduction to both gaming and um, CG world. Uh, but importantly, I think centrally is, is game engines. So I, I worked on that on and off for a couple of years as the writer. And uh, that obviously gave me the best introduction possible to all of the technologies that we are now uh, using um, all the time. Um, so that was the start of it, and then after, after after Call of Duty, I was like, "Well, this is it. This is this is super cool." I was particularly enamored with with game engines and with the possibilities of game engines for creating content, not just in gaming, but in in movies and in VR. So VR was kicking off in a big way in 2014, 2015, and I was like, from a storyteller's point of view, this is super super interesting to me. Um, just come off making you know really amazing scenes and cutscenes with digital human avatars that were very photorealistic and I thought well if we could just step into VR this would be a very interesting area for me to explore and um and it's very important that you know that coming off Call of Duty seems these technologies in in use uh being used and then of course Unreal and Unity were off the shelf game engines that anybody could use so it seemed plausible to start working in in these uh in these game engines um and um so we started working with Unreal um, from 2015, 2016, um, mostly making non-gaming content, mostly in VR and got into AR in a big way. Um, won the first uh, Lumiere Award for Best AR Experience in 2018, which is for a, a marketing campaign we did for a Netflix show, Altered Carbon. But uh, made a whole bunch of really cool VR pieces uh, that were shown around the world in, in different contexts a um, bunch of projects. Um, so yeah, it's sort of been, you know, we've sort of trod this path of the evolution of both digital humans and the use of game engines for uh, multiple uh, uh, uses. 
Um, so yeah, I've sort of been uh, following and being part of spearheading the, the use of real-time technologies for for last decade or so. Yeah, and that's um, you know one of the things that that's the, the, the going to be the commonality today is virtual humans, virtual production, real time, right? But there's some really interesting topics from your point of view that I want to cover, right? I mean, so much of the storyline now has been tech, um, and that's a foundation, right? But then it's really how do the creators tap into this, right? And that that that's sort of what's interesting and what uh, some people might not be aware of is that you were the founder of the Real-Time Filmmakers Group on Facebook, close to 11,500 members now, um, it been going for a few years, I believe, and, and sort of, it'd be good to know a little bit about that as well as McKenna Studios, right? Sort of how long you, you know, as McKenna Studios has been around, uh, you're, you're centralized in LA, but, you know, relative to virtual beings and digital avatars, like why, you know, why start that group? And then how does that correlate sort of into your professional life? Well, I was, it was interesting because sort of VR and AR kind of had its moment and it's still having its moment, but, you know, sort of 2018 was the sort of VR winter, um, 2019 going to that. And then, of course, the pandemic uh, happened. Um, I think I started, I mean, I was very interested in movies. I always have been interested in movies as a, as a, as a platform for creation. Obviously, that's my background as a, as a screenwriter, um, but obviously I've, I've gone into gaming quite a bit. Um, but it always seemed the underexplored territory in particular use of game engines because you've got a game engine there's a clue in the title but of course you know we could we can use that game engine to make all sorts of content and of course what i was interested in is movies but not just movies like okay there it is the final rendered movie but creating content that can say start as a movie but because it's got certain shared properties can exist in other platforms other forms that can then expand um, what that movie experience is, um, depending on what the IP, what the story is, into 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 different realms. And of course, because I've been working in VR and AR, that was obviously a big interest to me. And of course, in gaming, but movies for me seemed like the underutilized resource because obviously, you know, the gaming world is massive, it's huge. All the developers in this space working with real-time game engines are primarily using it to make games, obviously. Um, and I thought, well, movies, you know, particularly after Call of Duty, I came back and, you know, we're working with Kevin Spacey and the likes of Hollywood actors. And I'm like, well, I sort of came back to Hollywood and I said, why don't we use game engines to make this stuff? And they were just like, no idea what I'm talking about, first of all, and then no interest. <laughs> so, but I, I, my experience was, was transformative on Call of Duty, believing in what digital humans and you know cinematic experiences or storytelling you know it, it's a it's a pretty broad kind of term but i kind of thought well if we could make a movie in unreal in a game engine you know it, this is a 2d linear fully rendered experience um but it's made within a within a 3d interactive um game engine then that suddenly changes the whole equation about what a movie is how it's made, how it's consumed, what you know types of ROI you can then produce from from that as an IP. So it's it's a sort of game changer, literally, um, as to as to you know making stuff. And so movies, I was always trying to get a movie off the ground. Um, one of the movies that I, I I had was actually an old script of mine that that Steven Spielberg at one point wanted to to make, which was an adaptation of uh, Rudyard Kipling's book called Kim. And we had uh, Neil Sethi, who was the um, he played the um, Mowgli in the Jungle Book, uh, attached to that. And you know, we had Jackie Chan interested at, at one point to one of the characters. But you know, it, the technology nobody was interested in making a movie with a game engine. It was just seemed you know like a, a too too uh, a leap into the dark. And so, but I've I've maintained my belief in these technologies to make that sort of stuff because I'm like, well. I've made it, I've got this whole history of making cool shit, and I'm a screenwriter and a storyteller, so I kind of know how to put those two sides of the equation together. Um, so I'm like, yeah, I'm totally sold on this. I know I know we can make this. Um, trying to convince other people in the world is, is, is the problem. Um, so I've always been on this, this track to, to make a movie in Unreal as a sort of stepping stone into something more. Um, and with the real-time filmmakers, uh, I just wanted to start to cohere this community because a lot of people were doing interesting things with Unreal and particularly with in sort of filmmaking. And so I wanted to create just a sort of forum, a, a point that people could kind of gather um, 
you know, folks like Matt Workman were doing a lot of interesting stuff and a lot of sort of people just picking it up and starting to play and a lot of curiosity from the traditional live action world or visual effects folks who are like, well, what is what is real time? What can real time offer us? And so there's a lot of interest, a lot of experimentation going on that I thought uh, I wanted to sort of, you know, bring together. We should all be talking, you know, these people. Uh, um, so I started the Real Time Filmmakers Group, I think in like March of, 2020 and then of course the pandemic pretty much happened immediately after and it was sort of strange uh the sort of synchronicity because of course hollywood shut down overnight yeah. and there was religion i mean i remember that month there was like people were wondering are we going to be able to make stuff again because this is the early days of like nobody really knows what this is at all and everyone's like well it's, you know like all production had shut down completely unprecedented like the whole industry careers people like up in the Air about what was going to happen and what we we're going to make, and I was always like, "Well, virtual production." <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, as for a lot of people, it sort of accelerated that people's ways of thinking around that. What were you going to say, Pete? Oh, I was just going to say it completely accelerated, and and that's you know a good segue into sort of where we are now, right? I I, I was looking back at the history. I mean, virtual humans is such a broad topic, like so. I want to acknowledge the incredible work in VFX and academia that's led up to a lot of the technology innovations that have happened between, you know, an academic, you've got USC, ICT, Max Planck, Disney Research, yeah. and countless CGRAPH papers. You know, my experience of virtual humans started back in 2008 on a project called Digital Emily. It was a collaboration with Paul yeah. Bevex Group and USC um, at the time. You know, it was one of these things where we created Emily. Uh, she was this actress that was on the, uh, the Young and the Restless, I believe, one of the, one of the day soap operas. And so we recreated her with photogrammetry and then basically did face replacement on her. So it was sort of this false uh, recreation of her because we used her as a guide. Um, it's interesting now, fast forwarding 10 years, but one of the things that was really interesting at the time is people didn't know what was CG and what wasn't, right? We didn't really tell that. So we had people critical of the dress she was wearing, which literally was the dress she was wearing. So you started to blur that line, right? Which was interesting. Well, then you got into, you know, cubic motion with the siren and the Simon demos that really sort of put a, um, you know, the idea that this level of quality and starting to try to get over that other side of the uncanny valley, di digital domains work with Digital Doug. You know, we worked with Didi on a feature film back in 2008. Uh, Kim LeBerry was leading that up, trying to do filmmaking in a game engine, and it just didn't get off the ground. The visual fidelity wasn't there, and that's what held it back. Yeah. Um, the property itself was amazing. I still want to see that, see the light of day. But then you had, you know, Mike Seymour that's, that's obviously pushed that. So, you know, we were in this like demonstration era from 2008 to sort of 2020, 2021. Now I see us sort of evolving into this democratization era, right? And you have big players, Reillusion and Daz, uh, Ready Player Me, all these like companies that are sort of jumping in have been evolving over the last, you know, 10, 20 years, some of them. Unreal and Unity really have started to push this forward from a filmmaking and creation standpoint, opening up a lot of other applications on the human side, obviously what MetaHuman represents um, and what Ziva has done for Unity, um, you know, with the recent announcement at Seagraph. All of these tools and technology have sort of, now they're out in the world. And I think us as creators, you know, John and I, we were talking about this a little earlier in the week, like we're sort of hungry for that content, right? And it's still so early in, in, in its infancy you know, to me, the, the storyline for the last three to seven years has been the technology, but th that's not the story, right? We as a company have always looked at, well, okay, you can create amazing virtual humans, the skin looks real, the hair looks real, likeness is there, but now what? Now what are you going to do with that, right? How do you move these characters, empathize with these characters? And there's sort of, to me, two different points of view. You've got a storytelling point of view. Let's tell either linear content or interactive content, and then you have this sort of human connection, like virtual hosts, virtual concierge, virtual salespeople, you, you know, but you still want that human connection. Well, you've come at it from this screenwriting background and, and writing, directing, producing background, but you obviously have an appreciation for the tech. And so what is the motivation for you as a creator and filmmaker to take advantage of the convergence of all these technologies, right? Like that's the, you, you know, to me where the rubber meets the road is you've got to bring the creative community into this that it's not a technology story, right? It's an authentic story from a creator point of view. And, you know, having you here would be good to, to speak to that, you know, a little bit. It's, it's interesting because even the idea of a digital human or a virtual being is, is a slight misnomer as if like a digital human exists without any context. You know, like there are a bunch of technologies that are, you know, to do with visual fidelity or performance or 
or you know movement mocap or whatever but but what what does it mean to be a a, a digital human it only exists in in the context of how that digital human is deployed and what you know and is that interactive is that as part of a movie is that you know what is what is the format so so you can't you can't sort of separate the two you know there's a certain level in which you know as i said through the academic papers through seagraph you're sort of getting a sort of notion of visual fidelity technologies um but that's sort of like reproductive technologies it's the, you know the idea of a digital human is something still sort of beyond that um and again that is only uh, has any meaning in in a specific sort of context in what that then becomes uh, uh, you know, a digital human that people recognize as something that they have a meaningful connection with. Now that meaningful connection be interactive or non-interactive through a movie, you know, you have, a, you have a, a meaningful connection to a character in a story. Um, now those two, those two things are often largely conflated. You know, there, there's this sort of confusion about, you know, visual fidelity and that is a good digital human where I'm like, well, you know, you can have the best technologies in the world and it's still not work. You still not connect. You know, everybody's like trying to reach this imaginary bar of, um, you know, the uncanny valley. And of course it's a, it's a bell curve. So it's like, where are we on this curve? It's like, you're always and it's, there's a sort of scientism, you know, underneath it all that there is this sort of some sense of objective or that we've, we've conquered the uncanny valley, you know, and it's, as I said, it, it it's, it's not really, um, um, I, I'm not sure how helpful it is in terms of, you know, it becomes something that people get beaten over the, over the head about. It's an easy sort of criticism. Um, again, I mean, I always take my son, my 10 year old son as a sort of litmus test of, you know, who's watching this, who's consuming it. Um, you know, my 10 year old son has spent his whole life since day one as a digital native watching, you know, video game characters and digital humans. I mean, this is just, just the world in which he is, he thinks is, is real and normal. Um, he has obviously questions that a lot less than people who came in an era like myself that's pre-internet. You know, we're, we're pre, we're very much analog. Um, you know, uh, you know, born from the analog world. So it it only becomes a problem for those people who have still got one foot or who who derive from this sort of old analog world. I think for the new generations coming up, it's a different kind of set of equations. So, um, but. You know, to your point about the democratization of um, as says, there is that you know, these all of these technologies, and that's what's you know that's what got me into it was first you know Call of Duty. You know, it's a it's a dedicated game engine to making Call of Duty that's you know owned by Activision or you know they they put they own all of that. And then of course, what happens when you know Unity and Unreal become off the shelf things that anybody can use that changes the game completely and then all of the subsequent developments and the technologies that you listed um, to make those technologies readily available again further changes that equation enormously and that is what's most interesting to me in that you know i come from movies or from games and these are like mass mediums where a lot of people engage with it and i'm you know as a screenwriter i'm interested in culture now culture exists on a sort of mass scale and what that is it's not like uh you know on white papers and at seagraph you know it's it's like that's a part of it but it, for me it's only interesting when it becomes a, a sort of mass medium where we as a culture where these things become integrated into our life into our daily lives and the technologies themselves become invisible so and that is happening all around us all the time and you know the development of all these different digital human technologies is is only making that possible but again it, it comes down to there's been this huge evolution and all this stuff and there's a lot of really cool demos and this and that and meta humans and everything going on and i'm still waiting i'm still like you know the reason why you know come back to the real-time filmmakers group was to okay now let's get making stuff with this not because oh yeah here's a digital human that's made in unreal but just because hey this is a really cool cool movie or this is a really cool game or, or whatever it is we're making um and we're not really having the conversation about how you made that but more about like what you've made and what is how is yeah, that? And that's, and that's what I was hoping to get into this conversation because to me, it's not how you made it, right? And every there's plenty of tutorials and videos and influencers talking about that, right? But ultimately, any creator economy is a balance of sort of art and technology, science and art, right? And you have to have equal appreciation for both. And you know, we've we've long been in the space of trying to get over it on the other side of the uncanny valley. Well, 
if you get on the other side of the uncanny valley, to me, the success is nobody's talking about it because it feels real, right? Yeah. So what do you, how do you really define that? Well, to me, then you, it, it, you're getting more into the uncanny valley is one notion here, but to, it's more of that connection with the character. Yeah. You can feel something and it doesn't have to be photo real. Right. And, and that's obviously why our animated films tap into that with brilliant writing and character design and development. Um, but to me, what we really need to acknowledge is what we're going into as an era is reframing the creator ecosystem here. Yeah. There's this consolidation of creator tools that are going head to head with the legacy creation methods. Right. Linear content is 100 plus years old as a medium. Right. And has evolved over those years. But when you start to get into the reason gaming pushed this is that interactivity, right? And it had to be, you know, high frame rate and it had to sort of balance art and science to create a good game. But now you have all this benefit of, of how far that's been pushed and you're now trying to apply it to different areas um, and different creation areas. So in that vein, like what trends right now are interesting to you? Like when we start to look ahead, like we can acknowledge we need to reframe this ecosystem, but like, in this consolidation and we're going head to head with these legacy behemoths what trends do you think are going to actually start to to move that needle um in a bigger way well it's pretty interesting with the technology because technology is um pretty much always i don't know i mean i'll probably uh, be caught out on that but pretty much always top down you know it comes from you know because it just the sort of so social sort of orchestration of technologies to make that happen you know needs to happen you know with big entities behind that making it happen you know it's um but the the you know content and culture uh comes from below it always bubbles up from below i mean you know the movies is based on you know the success of movies is the spread of movies like nickelodeon it's like oh anybody can go and see a movie for a nickel you know what i mean and then you know everybody's watching this and then people every everyone everyday people you know not specialists not whatever is engaging with what what this is so for me and i think you know from creators i'm kind of interested in people who just want to make stuff and so real time just becomes the means to to making stuff um and as i say we we can do that's when i think it kind of gets interesting you know it, it's like it's like sort of hip-hop culture you know you got all these technologies and yet then hip hop culture turns it on its end, like just uses it in a way that it was never designed for and just creates this amazing stuff. That's where the real, real creativity is, is, is in the hands of people. And it's interesting with the entertainment industry for the last, I don't know, multiple decades, it's become more and more sort of top down, this sort of corporate consolidation that's taking place within the entertainment industries. And so that's become less and less, I feel, in terms of, you know, filmmakers, creators, indie developers, sort of bubbling up um, to, you know, becoming, you know, the next great thing. It was always like, say, if you take the, the 90s in, in America, the sort of indie filmmaking, you know, that that produced, you know, the likes of Quentin Tarantino, all these sorts of filmmakers that sort of came out of sort of low budget things that were taking more risks, that was sort of more, more interesting. Uh, there was a market for that, you know, on the back of, you know, old VHS, VHS tapes or DVDs. So there was a sort of monetization of that. Uh, that sort of, sort of seems to have sort of, sort of been missing from the modern equation of big streamers basically commissioning material that they need to own outright. And so we're sort of wedded to this sort of legacy business model still about ownership and what is content creation. And it's a little stifling but all of the technologies that we're seeing now offers new ways of making stuff um, that are in the hands of people who can create and there's new new means and technologies of monetizing that in ways that never were before so that i think it's i i want i mean that was my intention of creating the unreal filmmakers group was to really spark a sort of movement of indie developers creators making stuff that is outside of the traditional legacy system that can be more interesting, more experimental, taking more risks, um, and, and and see what comes of that. And also finding out, you know, one of the biggest things is it's all of, it's about the money. You know, movie making has got so expensive that you need all of these sign-offs from all of these different departments and all of these different executives because you know the is the mitigation of, of, of mitigation of, of risk. So what if you know there isn't that risk? What are there if there are other means of financing and monetizing your content? using the technologies that are around us. I mean, that's why Web3 is extremely interesting to me, 
Um, I've been interested in smart contracts since 2018 when I was first introduced to, to that world and spatial computing and, and blockchains. Um, my company made the first photoreal digital human to be registered on the blockchain in 2018. So, so we've been thinking and talking about these technologies for a long time, but I think now is the time, particularly after the, the, um, the crypto and NFT bubble bursting recently, that actually we can get on with the, with the work of actually creating you know, real products that have longevity, that can really um, uh, form the, the, the foundation for how we create that really does upturn or I don't know if it upturns it because I think there's always going to be the Disney's of the world and the big IPs and all of these, these. It's almost like that's fine. That's one thing. Yeah. But we can also have these other industries that don't have to make so much money. That can be these more sort of localized or just interesting, nuanced, you know, um, arenas of creativity that can be monetizable and profitable enough to make that an interesting space. And I think there's there's two big topics you, you touched on. I think one is we need to acknowledge that the crowd creation element, right? You creation's always been this role-based endeavor, right? And I think there's I've I've heard a lot of sort of discussion about sort of individuals creators and sort of that one person show mentality. And that's just not the way you create something, right? You come together bringing left and right brain in different points of view, you know, somebody that can do the lighting side of things, camera work uh character design and development all of that has to come together and i think you have to emulate that at this sort of second yeah. tier down from the and, and be able to identify those roles and, and where we're seeing the best sort of even indie content being created are people that are acknowledging that just because you can create a meta human in one button click doesn't yeah. mean you're an animator right yeah. and and so it also doesn't mean you know anything about camera work and getting all that done right so you've got to sort of assemble this team and one of those areas that also needs to be acknowledged is creators by their nature are not entrepreneur or business minded. You know, their motivations are very differently. You just want to create something to create, right? And it feels good and you want to be proud of your work and you want to get it out there. Well, inherently you're not trying to monetize that, right? Yeah. But that also the monetization sort of uh, lever here needs to be, we need to talk about that a little bit more. Like how does a creator survive and thrive to do that and there's obviously amazing platforms and tools available but you know when you you touch on web3 right and and obviously the nft and crypto bubbles that are up and down everybody's got varying polarizing points of view there but it's starting to build a, a foundation that i think can be something that creator that creator ecosystem these small teams of creators can tap into and not have to be the most sort of profit minded you know cutting against that grain of no i just want to be in my my safe space creating you know but you want to survive like what you know where do you what guidance i guess would you have for those creator entities to tap into that and what do you see like you've been on the blockchain for a long time from a creator point of view like mm -hmm. you know distill well, I mean, that's, that's part i mean it, it's interesting because i mean you know in 2022 i i launched the one of the first challenges the the uh the real time shorts challenge, you know, where I gave away the assets and then 30 days later, we had 30 short films come back and, and it was kind of really wonderful to see this height of the lockdown, you know, all around the world, people were collaborating, like forming these teams of people who came from different skill sets, you know, it's like, well, I can do the mocap, I've got an accent suit and I'm in Belgium and I, I can build the assets. And so people were, people were doing this because they had the time because there was a lockdown on, nobody was doing anything else. And, um, that was the sort of spirit that I really, you know, love to see was exactly that because you're you're completely right. You know, nobody can be, you know, have wear all the hats. You know, my job is to kind of understand where all the hats are and how they kind of fit together. But it, you know, people are specialized, you know, by the nature of the game, and so collaboration is really key. And so that was the thing about, you know, create a creative community of people that come to that community with, you know, different skill sets that can kind of come together to create something more than the sum of the parts. That's the whole thing. And so a movie for me is um, in some ways the sort of bar, you know, making a game engine stuff, you know, you've got a frame. It's not, it's not interactive. You know, there are so many things that you've taken away. You've, you've simplified what you're making. So that makes it easier to make in some ways. And so, um, um, so, so movies see, and, and there's a massive market for movies. You know, we, we, we mediate our whole world through screens, you know, iPads and, and iPhones. These are 2D 
um, devices. We're watching movies. We, you know, you and I are now talking on a 2D screen right now. So, so the world is still very much driven by 2D screens. And so, well, why not? You know, you know, movies seem like the underutilized market for that. But, you know, after my challenge, that you know, there was a whole bunch of challenges. I mean, all the Unreal fellowships. You know, everybody had to make a short film under that. So there's all these like little short films, little clips that people started to make. And I thought, this is great. This is awesome that people are doing this and the Epic's, you know, you know, initiating all of this and, and backing it. And but I thought, well, what if we were able to aggregate? And like, because all of these little short films that people work their asses off all, all for, for the whole month, and then it's like, oh, there it is. It plays out <laughs> on YouTube for like a, a minute or two, and then it sort of doesn't doesn't make anything more. You know, short films aren't a monetizable product. You know, it's a demo of your abilities to some degree. And that's that's kind of about it. It's it's not a market. There's no market for short films as such. So, but there's a market for movies, for feature films, for longer form content. And so, I mean, all of these challenges that I've seen, you know, in the last two years that have been very very interesting. Um, you know, I was watching the the one that the, that uh, Punisher did on on YouTube. You know, where he gave out the scene files and the animation, and you know, had something like three thousand people. But then you've got like all these scene these you know. 20, 30 second scenes or whatever tied together on this sort of thematically and with those assets and all the different people that were able to kind of create within that sort of limited palette it was very, very, very interesting. But I'm sort of watching and I'm like, okay, I've got a sort of low attention span, I guess. I'm like, you know, within a minute, I'm like, okay, what's next? You know, because it's 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 a sort of it's like really interesting wallpaper. And that's not to diminish anything that I'm watching there, but it's still, it's no bigger than the sum of the parts, but a movie, I, thought, so I, thought, I always thought, oh, well, what if we could aggregate this in some ways to actually make something a lot more than those just individual parts and had a life beyond just making a short film. And so with my recent challenges, it's kind of came about because um, I'd actually, I was working, um, I'd convinced a very well-known filmmaker to, to make their next movie in UE5. And so they had like $10 million and we were talking for months about this. And then it kind of fell apart um, at least from my point of view, um, for almost like traditional reasons about, you know, money, cost, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, I was like, really, I was really catch off because I was like, okay, this is the perfect scenario. We have everything we need to do this. We've got a really talented filmmaker. We've got a great script. We've got, I can put together the pipeline and the team to, to do this. We've got a budget, you know, which isn't a lot, you know, $10 million is not a lot of money in, in traditional filmmaking terms at all. It's still a low budget movie. Um, and so we have to make the right choices to do that. And we have to make it in the right way. And then as soon as you start sort of veering off into ways that are traditional legacy filmmaking kind of uh, philosophies, you're gonna you're gonna just lose it. So I thought, well, I need to get out and just make, make uh, a movie myself. I mean, I'm a screenwriter. I've got a, a script that I wrote last year that I was also developing. And I thought, I don't want to go outside of this. I just need to make this um, within myself with what I know that we can do using the resources and people that that, that I have around me. Um, and it will force me to work in a way that is very non-traditional and really think out the box, but in a way that will utilize all of these technologies that we've been talking about. And I'll put it all into one box called this movie that we're making. So so I thought, well, what if what if the problem isn't the money? Because every in you know, my whole career in Hollywood, I've been out here like nearly 20 years, and it's all about like, how do we get the money? How do the, where's the money? What's the money? What's the money? And so all of these all of these projects live and die on how the money is put together. So the sort of everybody forgets about the creativity because it just becomes like this desperate you know search and need to get the freaking money, and and that's the problem. And of course, the person who holds the money holds the key to the kingdom, owns everything, has control, makes all the decisions, blah 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 blah. Um, and then is also accountable. You know, there's an account. You know, I mean, if you're if you're spending thirty million dollars on something, you've got to be accountable for how that money is spent. So there's all these levels of 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 yeah. um, accountability that come into it that, that that mitigate risk, mitigate creativity, all of these things. And so we've sort of seen this like mush of stuff that gets made, as we all you know know and understand. And some stuff, great stuff, comes out of that, but it's problematic yeah. for a lot of creative people. So I thought, well, let's try and make a movie. Um, it's got a great script that I wrote, so we know it's a, it's a good start. It's a good start, uh, that's it. But, but also, I mean, I know, I mean, out of my experience over the last 10 years, you know, with these technologies, I know how to translate those technologies, you know, my creativity of the script or in using those technologies. So when I'm writing the script, it is totally, totally based around how I'm going to make that. 
uh, you know, in a game engine using a lot of assets from the Unreal Marketplace and what's available. Because I'm like, guys, we've got all this stuff available. It's like, it's ama- I mean, it's overwhelming. Every single, there's these amazing environments, amazing assets that come on board. And I'm just like stunned. Like there's these amazing, amazing cool stuff. And I'm like, dude, look around you. Just pick it up. Like you can buy it for 50 bucks. Go and make something, you know? And so it's it's very exciting to sort of make stuff in that way because then other people get excited about it too. Uh, brands come on board because they're like, oh wow, we need to, you know, because there's all this really cool stuff that needs promoting. People just just to go out there and make it. And so made these challenges. And of course, you know, two years ago I did the real time shorts challenge, which was very interesting and and successful. And I thought, well, why don't I partially make this movie through a series of challenges? Um, the first one we launched, um, 1st of September, was the Real Time Movie Challenge Mood Scene, where um, you know my movie consists of six basic environments, which are all assets from the Unreal Marketplace. So I curated these packs of, of assets, these six different things, and then people got to choose what mood scene they would create. Uh, and bear in mind, you know, I haven't told anybody what my movie is. I haven't even told them what the genre is. I've not given them a logline or a synopsis. Nobody's read the script. Nobody knows nothing about this. They just know, like, okay, this is a cool environment. Go and create a mood scene, you know, create an atmosphere. And that's all I need is to pass out these, these different elements to people. Um, and then the next one is the, the dance challenge because there's a scene in my movie that takes place in a virtual, virtual nightclub. So I thought either I can make all those characters myself and animate them procedurally, you know, that's certainly the, the way to do it. But what if I engaged the community and got people involved because a lot of people have made an avatar and want to put that into a movie. And then what are the economics of, of then crowdsourcing people's avatars and putting them in my movie as essentially digital extras? You know, how can we prove a kind of use case of NFTs and blockchain registered um, assets that can have some sort of revenue share? Now, you know, I get I get to use those assets for my movie and have some sort of revenue share because it only has value. So if you've got 200 avatars individually, they're not really necessarily worth anything, you know, or very much. But if I can put them all together and put them in something called a movie that then becomes successful, then what is the value of that NFT drop that when we when we come to do that for all of those people? So I've created the value by aggregating all of these avatars together and putting them in a form, a movie that has meaning above and beyond those individual assets and you know the individual circumstances in which they were created. So, and then I can reward the community and have the community participate in the financial benefits of that, as well as creating something of value. So it's always this sort of shifting of this energies and harnessing of these energies and just putting them in the right direction and finding these synchronicities between different you know, people creating and how we can then sort of monetize and create with that. So that's the whole underlying philosophy. I call it like win-win. Everybody wins. Everybody gets exactly what they want out of it. It's completely transparent. You know, I so say like, this is what we need. We need avatars, a lot of dancing. This is what you need to do. This is how you'll be rewarded. And this is what's going to happen. And it's it's pretty simple and straightforward. So. Yeah, it's you know it's this fascinating new approach to just storytelling and filmmaking in general, right? And and obviously virtual humans are going to inter- be introduced in this at some point, right? Is you're starting with the environments, setting moods around. Your approach to writing the script was knowing the the, the environments you're going to need that were possible in said technology, right? And I always I'm like one of the things I, I I honed in on in my career is sort of the mechanisms and the motivations, right? Your motivation is coming from a pure sort of filmmaking standpoint, but knowing that there's a bunch of people that need to be involved in this process, right? The mechanism is all these tools that are available, the asset and the marketplace that are available, bringing that together, but you're giving it a purpose, right? You're giving there's a purpose and in in setting everybody's compass in the right direction. And what I think is going to be fascinating is the idea that you're, you're expanding on sort of assets and then think of a virtual human as now a character. There's a story behind this character and who they are. So you create this first film. Spinoffs are limitless, right? Because you've you've got uh, you've got that whole environment created, right? In in the backstory and where they live yep. and who their friends yep. are and when, how they interact and what trials and tribulations they've been through, right? And so you did the shorts contest, which which helped motivate that. But you know, I, I would say what's what's sort of on the on the horizon here right you're you're smack dab in the middle of the of the real-time movie challenge 
Um, you've put together an impressive set of judges I want to talk about, but then the dance challenge, well, then what's next, right? What's next in this? And what I'm hearing that we haven't done yet, right, because you have a script, is, is that storytelling aspect of it. Like, what does a virtual table read look like yeah. before you even get into the end, just before you even start shooting? Like, what are these characters and how do they start to evolve? You know, it's sort of like the 11 second club, you know, where you give everybody a script and everybody just takes a different take on it, you know, like that's fascinating as a creative process because the best idea wins, right? You just get yeah. sort of inspiration from all walks of life. Um, where do you see this going and, and what's next beyond the two challenges? Well, it's interesting because, you know, uh, it's sort of related to, I'm mean, trying to answer it around it. So everybody's talking about like, oh, we're building the metaverse. So we just need to go and build the metaverse as if the metaverse exists and as if it's, it, as if it's a sort of singular thing, but everybody's, you know, on this path to build the metaverse. And it's funny, like, you know, with the whole crypto world of, you know, bored apes and like, you've got these bored apes that have value and then we're going to create a metaverse around it. Okay. So you, you've basically got what's well, the one thing and now you've actually got to create everything from that, that could well completely fail. There's nothing, you know, so, you know, I, I think the whole thinking around that is kind of wrong. Whereas like any IP, you know, Superman, Batman, they're 80 years old, they're nearly a century old that, is, that have evolved through multiple different, uh, you know, formats and, you know, comic books to TV, to movies, to whatever. It, it's something that grows and it grows org organically according to what people like, how, you know, what the technologies are. And that's the same with all of this stuff to do with the metaverse. So the more that we can, um, I mean, that's why I think, you know, our projects become very, because as soon as I start talking to people about it in like the NFT world and crypto world, they're like, oh, how can we be involved? Because I'm basically creating a sort of a forum to sort of showcase, we're actually building the actual bricks of, of the metaverse, you know, rather than, oh, here's the metaverse and now we're going to build it all. So it, it's a, it's very much an evolutionary thing. So having having the goal and endpoint in mind is the wrong way to think about it in some ways, you know, in the sense that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a storyteller, I've got a script, so there's a script there, that's a blueprint for it, which is sort of help frame stuff. But what, what I'm al allowed to do is to be very kind of open as to how we, we then evolve that and change that according to the technologies I want to deploy and the brand partnerships and the different entities and communities that I'm, I'm involved with, with making this. So in terms of, you know, goals, it, it's more like how can we evolve this and play and have fun and create this one thing that can then create and mushroom and sort of self-generate of, of itself with with no real sort of necessary North Star other than, hey, let's get in there and have some fun. And, you know, because each one of those modules, like a movie, you know, I can make a movie and a movie can, it's got a marketplace. We can make money off of the movie. And then we've got that money to then evolve into into, into other areas and things. But in regard to the, the, to the challenges, um, It'll be interesting to see what's next because you talked about, um, you know, giving different people, you know, the story and and performers. I, you know, mocap is I think amazing for actors. Um, I think it's really really interesting. We're we're involving, we're deploying, um, and there are a lot of hugely very interesting stuff to do with AI and procedural animation uh, that I find very very interesting at this point and how that human element. Um, is, you know, becomes part of a, a you know, a, a, a technology stack involving AI, machine learning, proceduralism, all those sorts of things. So how do we communicate that, that human quality of a performance of a character um, that comes from a human, you know, in terms of performance capture, um, but nevertheless, you know, is articulated through all those technologies as well. So again, the great thing about what I'm doing, I think at this point with this movie is I hold all the reins. You know, I'm not accountable to any corporation. There's no IP that I have to be, you know, that's part of the problem with the movie that, you know, we were going to be making it like came with so many attachments of like, they didn't own the IP, but they were licensing it. And, um, you know, all these, all these considerations. And so what if we could just purely you know, move forward in the way that works for this equation. I think that's the best way to kind of, um, to achieve something really quite remarkable, so. Yeah, I mean, you're you're in that, the, the Wild West, right? That pioneering phase where you're out on the, on the frontier and you, there's no sort of restrictions, right? Yeah. Um, but you're, you're staying true to your roots and true to the creator roots. 
And I think that, you know, we need to continue to acknowledge that, you know, one of these sort of, we talked about trends and tech and something that's sort of upbringing. I've seen a few questions in the, in the question box here about AI tools, things like Dolly and Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, Google just had an image and release. Like, how does this affect creators and filmmakers? My point of view is you end up, you're going to need to start to combine the best of, of all these parts, right? Yeah. I don't think AI filmmaking is just going to completely take over. It's just going to create all the weird stuff you see where, like, what did the internet come up with? You know, um, but, you know, very quickly you start to see the quality here, the, you know, from just like a, a character design and look development standpoint, just amazing artwork that never would, you know, it's sort of the sum of all human minds, like coming together, right? It's, it's fascinating. I don't think you're going to fully replace that anytime soon, right? I think you still need sort of that narrator and guide to bring all of this together. However, where can AI play a critical role here? right and, and and push things forward right to me real time is all about iteration and yeah. being able to create quickly and see if it's working or not working and that's a fundamental principle of storytelling right of what's working and what's not so how do you see ai playing into this uh this whole discussion we've been talking about uh hugely um i think it's it's the the biggest unknown i mean in a way i mean it, you know, that's what I mean. Again, it's like I'm I'm providing an opportunity to really explore how we deploy that in a in a meaningful sense. Because yeah, all of this sort of, you know, Dali and Mid Journey, it's amazing. And like when it first comes out, we're all like, you know, my whole feeds are like full of all this stuff, and it's like really cool. And then it sort of dies off because it's sort of like, okay, where do we go with that? What do, what do we what do we do with that now? You know what I mean? It's like it sort of becomes a thing, and then it's like it's like all, it all kind of oh yeah there's another one <laughs> i feel like metahumans like metahumans comes out I'm like oh my god this is crazy this is so cool da, 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 da. and then it's like okay where how do we put all that into something and and what i i'm trying to do here is have a really good vessel for putting all of these things into into to deploy that for an actual product that is then meaningful and, and again like these things aren't end goal like like AI and machine learning, this is this the its very definition is evolving. You know, it's constantly moving and growing and changing. So, so it, it, again, it's like this sort of lack of an objective is almost you know having specific objectives. Like we're making this movie with this character in this scene at this time to achieve this goal. That's fine. But I kind of like the fact that you know we'll 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 be able to deploy you know what's available to us in late you know, 2022, early 2023, all these things are available and we can use this project to accelerate those things. But within 12 months time, those things will be surpassed by something better. And hopefully what we do will be part of that evolution. So, so I, I guess my goal is, is not to have like, this is where it's all going, but to just facilitate means in which those technologies can have a meaningful and economic existence within the culture, because that's the only, that's the only real accelerant. You know, these days, you know, it's like the iPhone. The iPhone is the biggest accelerant of technology in the last, you know, 15 years, you know, by far, I would say, you know, but in terms of content, I mean, just think how it's revolutionized. Content. You don't have TikTok without the iPhone, you know, it's like, you know, but you don't have all those technologies in terms of motion sensing and scanning and all these things because of the iPhone, you know. So in a way, you know, uh, you know, we need content and pieces of, of content that, that really utilizes this. And, and as I say, like at the level of like a Netflix, and Netflix is obviously building this huge equation with virtual production to these big, big things, but there's this much more sort of grassroots organic way that's a lot more cutting edge, really. I mean, yeah. honestly, it's like, I think with studios, it's almost like, you know, um, you know, I went to a thing the other day um, that was, you know, uh, an exposition of virtual production technologies to, to traditional filmmakers in Hollywood, it's like in, in Hollywood, and and it sort of seemed a little bit like uh, you know you sort of realize how Hollywood is still really far behind where the technologies are, what you know where, where, where they're happening. So I I don't know. For me, it's really exciting to be an indie working sort of almost under the radar, um, putting these things together that will hopefully you know really influence the shape of which you know where media and content goes and help just grow and propagate these things that's that's the thing it's not it's not one person or one project that's going to change it it's a whole community and I, it's yeah, being part totally. of the evolution of that that for me is important that's why i've you know my whole process is about involving the community and people because that's where it's at 
Yeah, and, we, and you need a level of patience and you need a level of flexibility, right? As you're saying, yeah. this is going to evolve, right? Yeah. And, and you can't lean into one tool or one trend. Like it's, you, you got to stay sort of light on your feet. And, and, and speed only helps here, right? In terms of iteration. Yeah. I, um, so I encourage everybody, if you've got questions, we're sort of going to go into that section. Uh, I've got a, a whole feed here I want to start to work through. Uh, Gary had some really sort of good observations as you're going through this. Yogi said, if you don't know where you're going, you might not get there. <laughs> right. Uh, but, you know, real time also allows for rehearsals and that's where a lot of creativity takes place. I, I, I think we're, we're so obsessed in our culture about objectives and goals that, that, that it's crucified everything. That, so people are people have become chained to the objective and they sort of miss the wood for the trees in so many ways. I, you know, I'm a big proponent of play. I mean, look at look at all these technologies, you know, and that's the beauty of games. Why do people love games? Why do love people making games? Because it's play, you know. Making should be play. It should be fun. It should be exploration. You know, yeah. it's it, it's like it shouldn't be like. Well, you know, we, the trouble is that like when it gets too big, and it becomes too corporatized, and there's too much money, it has to be nailed down. That's why you have like, well, this is the storyboard to, 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 to and then we have previs to kind of work out what that is, and so everything becomes very processed and and um, quantified or quantized in the sort of you know music world, you know. And that's that's fine. That that that's a huge accelerant in many ways for to be able to quantify masses of stuff. But at the yeah. heart of creativity is is play. And I and what I always loved about these technologies in real time is the ability to play like like you're literally live in a CG environment with a completely CG character and you're playing live. I mean that's that's the hardest part, but that's what we're doing in VR. You know, you're literally in these environments and seeing what comes of it. Um, that that's what we need more of. You know, it's not about having five-year plans because, you know, it's funny because it's in this whole world of technology, there's always like futurists, and we're all like, what's going to happen next? And there's all this raising of money that's all based on what's going to happen next, predicting the future. And guess what? Any prediction, I guarantee it, that somebody has made five years ago did not happen. They're all just speculating about what it is, like a pandemic can happen and therefore things happen, go over here. The iPhone comes up and things go over here. It's really, um, the world doesn't actually work like that. That's just the world in which corporations need to plan because they need to make a plan. They need to structure. Yeah, yeah, of course. Right? It, doesn't, it doesn't mean that that actually matches reality at all. So I think we need to really, you know, and, and yet our world has been dominated by plans and structures. and the beauty of this for me is that it gets it back to it, you know, lowers the costs, makes it easier, makes us able to just get in there and play. We can make mistakes. Making mistakes is hugely important to any creative process. Whereas in the corporate world, you can't make a mistake. It's got to be like this is the SOW. This has got to work like this. This is what it is. Like everybody's terrified of making a mistake because the costs are so 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 hard to swallow, you know, yeah, and they just like get buried. It's a much but, it's a much bigger game right and, yeah. and like we look at it from our our point of view like what our product roadmap looks like on the facebook side of things and we see this democratization happening yeah. but we've got to have business reasons to go here yeah right and and so we can't ignore that right and it's it's a fundamental thing but we you know there's enough proof points here as a business for us to know we can confidently jump into this space right how characters are cre being created is commoditized we help move those yeah. characters we've got some exciting things coming up there's a few questions in here that I think would be good to expand on because I don't think it's talked about enough, right? I, I love the the notion of play and create and emergence, right? And, and getting everybody sort of working in that space. But fundamentally, you need the right people working on the problem at the right time. And and we have to acknowledge, this is another question from uh, the community here, is the money is, the, when you're talking about the money is the nail on the head. If a producer wants professionals to contribute their time, studio money, payroll, et cetera, they'll insist on some payment up front. Working on spec in the industry isn't something that talented people want to do. So how do we deal with that? Well, that's exactly what I'm trying to work out. I, I think it, I think it's super. It's interesting because I mean, I was I, you know I worked as a screenwriter, um, you know, ten years ago. I was rep by Brillstein and, and ICM, you know, the two biggest management and agents in town. You know, I was working on Call of Duty, and yet all the work I was doing was speculative, going out for meetings and basically um, having to put together my take on somebody else's IP. And I'm doing all that for free because then the carrot is, oh, well, you, you'll you get the job to write this script and you'll get paid, you know, what, $100,000 to go and write this script for them. 
but you find yourself doing all this work for free um you know like like four weeks to prepare for a pitch uh you know basically break down what that whole you know read the book read the whatever um break it down into a movie come up with the, the a take that's for a story then go and pitch it that takes that takes a lot of time and you're kind of expected to do that for nothing and then you realize that there are six other writers of the same level of, as you these are all like now quote unquote like you know hollywood writers working for free on it is basically become like free development so i'm, I'm very familiar with um with exploitation <laughs> uh really familiar with it and that was like well this is just it's fucked it's like this is just not this is just not not what i it was sold as so i i'm a huge um proponent of people being obviously rewarded for that because you know there there are otherwise it doesn't work it just doesn't work you know and um but i think there are different ways in which people can engage and again like what i'm trying to do is explore those um and that's why i call it a win-win situation in that you know i'm like this is what this is what we're doing um this is how we can reward you this is how you can participate in this bigger project that you know if you take part in this challenge it actually it doesn't begin and end with this challenge it potentially moves on to this much bigger equation that you can all be part of um, I think transparency is is massively huge and just a level of integrity and honesty. I think, uh, you know, it, it, you look at the traditional industry, um, you basically have like um, big, powerful entities. Um, let's put a name on it, Marvel, say, or Disney, who's just, in a sense, it, it isn't a criticism of them as individuals or companies. It's just the nature of the relationship of leverage in late capitalism. You know, it's like you're a big, powerful company that you need people. So then you can employ all these different vendors that have a bunch of teams of people. And it's the race to the bottom of, you know, how can you get that for as little amount as possible money? You know, so you're inevitably, you know, this structured in this relationship of conflict where I have to protect myself and keep my cards hidden to myself. To, and, and in a way, lie about like what we're doing, like, oh, no, no, yeah, we're going to we need this amount of money because you're going to get pushed back and somebody trying to take. So it's this constant sort of like tussle where nobody's being honest, nobody's being transparent, uh, and nobody is actually getting their needs met because everybody ends up kind of feeling that they got screwed and then the product is a bit crap or doesn't get to do it or something. So I, you know, I've you know, literally experienced that for years. <laughs> yeah, and so I, I, you know, I know how that feels um, and I know it doesn't, it, it, it's 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 the nature of the beast, and that's why I want to change the beast. Um, I think that there's got to be another way. I, I don't I, even have to have all the answers now, but I'm just like there's all these amazing technologies and all of this uh, will to do something. There's got to be a different way. So how can we how can we do that? And we need tangible tangible things to explore that with. And it's not going to happen through the system because the system is the way the system is. It's top. Yeah, it's, 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 got, it's, it's very different. Work, different everybody works in the same way. You've got studios and you've got vendors. You're a service. If you're a service, you've got to charge as much money as you can for that service. That's your business model. If you're a studio, you've got to get those services for as little amount of money as possible because you've got to make your thing for a certain budget. That's that's just it. That's universal. Well, what if that wasn't the equation? That's how yeah. I'm starting. No, it's, I mean, it's a fantastic thesis that I think is going to push the industry forward, right? And, and well, this it's round well. it, it shouldn't just be a thing. It's not just the, I mean, that's my whole problem. Like there are all these technologies let's make it real let's make it tangible yeah. you know i'm super interested in like what how do we write a smart contract that is equitable for everybody and works you know and we might not always get it right or we can say like okay this is what we're trying to do what is this you know what is the level of smart contracts that we can put in there that is going to get us so far you know all these technologies are evolving so i'm putting together the smartest minds the most interesting companies who are working all this stuff who have a stake in making it work because all of these companies they 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 all want the same thing as me well, it's you know? the it's the win win mentality, right? Yeah. And and that's that's what's what you're tapping into, you know. And I know we're right up here on time. There's definitely a lot of questions I didn't uh, unfortunately didn't get a chance to. We will respond to those. Uh, we will be rebroadcasting this. Um, there are we'll post some links here in the chat for the two contests that John talked about. Although the the uh, mood scenes challenge uh, we're in the middle, it's back in the middle of. That's yeah. we've got the, the the panel of judges. They'll be uh, wrapping up on that, and then the avatar dance challenge will run through the month of October. And then we'll look to what's next. Uh, we'll post some links and send those out to the Real Time Filmmakers Group and, and McKinnis uh, Studios as well, so you can and, and track and follow uh, John and what he's doing in his endeavors. Uh, it's always fascinating. 
Uh, we'll keep you up to date with what Facebook is doing specifically to go after this space um, and, and love this sort of uh, open thoughts that you've had here, John. I mean, it's there's so many topics here to unpack, you know, an hour just does not do justice, you know, to everything that we want to talk about here. So I'd welcome another opportunity to talk through this again yeah. um, and hear from the community. What, what did we not cover? Um, there's fascinating things going on with music videos and how music's evolving. Uh, VTubing and streaming is obviously a thing. And it's all built around this, this cool thing called the metaverse that's apparently a, a thing out there. Um, but we have to do the things to make this reality. Um, and I think it's this is a step in the evolution of content creation. Games, film, they all had different sort of trajectories and there's a convergence here, but there's also uh, things that are gonna stay in their lane uh, because the creator mentality, you know, games are sort of interactive and play and you're bringing players in, whereas linear content is entertaining an audience from a particular point of view and telling a script. So um, we need to respect all of that and respect the art and technology, uh, but build things that, and mechanisms uh, to do that. And that's, that's, that's sort of one of my motivations in what we're doing. And, and so I appreciate the like-minded approach here. Um, thank everyone for their time. You know, we're right at, we're right at time here. We will send the full broadcast out. There's a couple of questions on sort of uh, people that couldn't attend for the full time, uh, but we'll go ahead and, and wrap things up. And I, I appreciate your time, John. Yeah, thank you very much. And anybody in the audience, uh, feel free to follow me, ping me, reach out if you have other questions or if you want to be involved in my continued endeavors in building this equation. Um, yeah, we're all about building the community. So. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys.